during, during the time of Lord Buddha, many beings in this world were under the control of this deity named Ishvara. Ishvara and his consort Ishvari. In Tibetan, we call it Jige and Dutsema. Okay, so you just call it Ishvara, Ishvari. Ishvara is one of the is one of the most powerful gods of samsara. We have six realms of samsara, and above the human realm, we have the gods and the demigods. So the gods is the highest existence of samsara. It's like very wealthy people in this world that have their own helicopters and yachts and ships. They have billions of dollars, and everything they want is at their fingertips. Some of them even own small little uh, small little countries, you know, like Monaco. And sorry, I'm comparing it to people in this world that are very wealthy and that have everything. But above people in this world, there's a realm called the god realms. The god realms are where people can reincarnate and live there for a few hundred years and enjoy incredible wealth and sensual desire. But when their karma for that realm finishes, they take rebirth in another realm again. So what they do is they go up and down, up and down, up and down. So in this realm of gods, there's a particular god, his name is Ishvara, and he's very, very powerful, and he's very, very strong. And the overwhelming thing about him is that he's extremely, he has clairvoyance, he can give you well, he can get angry, he can get sad, he can get happy, but he's very, very powerful. And he is so powerful that gods always have different parties and get-togethers and have social occasions. Whenever they have a social occasion, because he was very powerful, he would be too busy because he has four main consorts. He would always be in union with the consorts, meaning he's in copulation. So he is too busy in copulation, too busy in his own little world. Whenever the other gods are having parties or having things going on, he would send a representative. What he would send is his phallic symbol, his phallic symbol united together with the female phallic symbol in union. So that that in India they call that the sheep lingam. Okay? So actually he was he would show the phallic symbol like this. This would be made into stone. This would be the male, this would be the female in union, and he would have this one and it would float and it would go. Because in India they still worship it. It will go to the parties when it arrived at the party because he's powerful. It will float to the parties when it arrived at the party. What would happen is this is all the other gods had to offer milk on it, offer milk on it, offer flowers, offer sweets, offer whatever, and then through his psychic power he would see whether they show him respect or not. And so a lot of people in samsara would worship him. A lot of people. And the more you worship him, the more you experience sexual bliss, the more you experience desires, and you'll get your wishes, and you'll be able to live long. But the problem is worshiping him always created contaminated bliss or unhappiness eventually, because he was also just a god, but a very long life. So what happened was, Buddha Shakyamuni at that time saw that he was, because Buddha didn't only teach the humans. He talked to the non-humans and to the gods, to the nagas, to the spirits. He talked to many beings, whoever he can benefit. One of the beings that he can benefit was Ishvara. He saw it was time to conquer or take over Ishvara. So what he did is Ishvara resides on earth on Mount Kalash. Mount Kalash itself is where Ishvara resides. So what Buddha Shakyamuni did was, Buddha Shakyamuni emanated exactly the same look as Ishvara. Ishvara basically has four faces, 12 arms, and two legs, and he's in union with four consorts. So Buddha Shak and he has twenty-four very powerful dakas and dakinis that reside in twenty-four places in the world. And so what happened was Buddha Shakyamuni himself manifested as Ishvara, the whole entourage. So when Ishvara saw him, he saw himself and he got a shock. He says, well, who's this? What's this? And Buddha taught him the Dharma, conquered him, and took over his whole entourage. So when he conquered him, he was subdued. It is said in the Buddhist text, what happened was Ishvara actually died at that moment, took rebirth in Kichara paradise to practice the Dharma. Then another version is that he actually folded his hands and submitted to the Buddha. 
He submitted to the Buddha, which is also conquering. All right? And symbolically, when you submit to the Buddha, conquer, you take rebirth in the Chara Paradox. All right? So it can be both. One is symbology, one is actuality. So he, he became the subject of Chakras, uh, he became the subject of Hiruka. And what happens was, he and his entourage and his whole property was taken over by Shakyamuni. So outwardly, he looks like Hiruka or Chakra Sabada deity and the entourage, but inwardly, he is already a fully enlightened being, which is Shakyamuni. So Shakyamuni took on that form, and from that form, Shakyamuni taught the Tantras to different beings of Heruka. And this Tantra was specifically for the times of the degenerate age, which is now, where people's desire is very, very strong. What he mentioned earlier, Singpiao, people's desires are very strong. So when people's desires are very strong and they have, they have more places to manifest it, it is said that during this time when we do this practice, it was counter. It will counter desire, it will counter our manifestation desire much more strongly. So therefore, during the past time, during Buddha Shakyamuni's age, and it's very easy to practice Hiruka's Tantra. Hiruka has four faces and twelve arms, and also has a huge entourage, 64 deities basically. And what happens is, it's not an easy Tantra to practice. The meditation is very thick and very, very, very extended, and it takes hours. Just to recite it takes about two hours. So what happens is, to make it even more simplified for people, Hiruka transformed into his consort, Vajugini, and Vajugini manifested her teachings and her tantra to practice, which is called a condensed Hiruka practice. So when you do Vajugini's practice, you're actually doing Hiruka's condensed practice, and Hiruka is a direct emanation of Shakyamuni. So when people say Tara is an uh, Vajugini's emanation of Tara or wisdom and all that, symbolically can be, but actually is a direct emanation of Shakyamuni. Let's say, but Shakyamuni is male, she's female. What difference does it make? Enlightenment is not subject to a body gender. Now, she's manifested as a female, so she is a condensed form of Hiruka's practice. Condensed. So her, her practice is much shorter, just as complete, and much quicker, and much more efficient, because it's shorter. 